Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Is that Charlie Whitcomb back there? Welcome, Charlie. Oh, and by the way, Andrew and Caitlin are here too. And Joel and Blake. But Charlie. Anyway, Merry Christmas. This morning we're going to be looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Um, we're going to look at a portion of verse 6, but let me read for you Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The prophet Isaiah, as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We celebrate birthdays, of course, in our culture. Uh, Christmas time is the time when Western civilization traditionally celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, next month, our country has a holiday for the celebrating the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. And then, of course, February, President's Day used to be too, Was uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and, and so on. And the reason that we set aside holidays to remember the birth of these individuals is because of the importance of those men. And uh, out of all of those men that I mentioned, none of them can compare to the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of importance. And uh, the Bible sets this forth in a number of ways. Isaiah helps us to understand the importance of Jesus Christ by the, the names that he uses in chapter 9 and verse 6 um, to describe him. He, in verse 6, he says, his name shall be called, and then he goes on to give five or four names. And so the, the way that we're looking at these names this morning is considering them one because they refer to one person. So in a sense, a five-fold name of Jesus. And at the get-go here, let me also acknowledge that um, there, there's one group of interpreters and uh, Bible commentators who see four names here. So wonderful counselor would, would be one name. And then there's another group of interpreters and commentators who see five separate names. Um, I'm going to treat the text as if Wonderful and Counselor are two separate names, so, so five names. But either way, all of these names or words reveal really important truths about who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. So therefore, why Christmas is important. So... Um, it's also helpful to remember the context here because Isaiah is talking to us a, about a very unique child who would be born, a very unique son who would be given. And in chapter 7 and verse 4, his uniqueness is underscored by the uniqueness of his conception and birth because there we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which Matthew says in Matthew chapter 1, uh, the translated meaning is God with us. So this son who is given, this child who is born is very, very unique. And uh, we're going to see his uniqueness as we see how Isaiah describes him. So, with that introduction under our belts, the, the first name, or the first part of this five-fold name, if you will, that we'll consider is the name 
Wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful. And one reason that I think it's appropriate to think of Wonderful as one specific separate name for Jesus is because it is used that way at times in the Old Testament. Like in Judges chapter 13, verses 17 and 18, when the angel of the Lord, who by the way, is probably an incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus, the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah, the father of Samson. Uh, Samson had asked of the Lord, what is your name? And in Judges chapter 13 and verse 18, the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? And it seems as if God is saying that his name is wonderful. And it's the same exact Hebrew word in Judges 13 and eight, uh, verse 18 that Isaiah uses here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And that word means, so the word that's translated wonderful, it means extraordinary. Something that's hard to understand. Incomprehensible. And indeed, that's a very appropriate name for the God of the Bible. So later on in Isaiah, Isaiah is going to write in chapter 40 and verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? But the interesting thing is that here, this title, this name, Wonderful, is applied to this son who is given, this child who is born. It's given to this promised son, Jesus Christ himself. And to understand why, I want to I weave together a whole bunch of truths and statements from the Bible that um, the writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith and um, the writers of the Second London Baptist Confession uh, used to, to write this expression about Jesus. Listen to this. This is poetry, but it's good, sound, biblical theology, and it's, it's awesome. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. So the writers of the Westminster Confession wrote this about Jesus. The Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is truly and eternally God. He is the brightness of the Father's glory, the same in substance and equal with him. He made the world and sustains and governs everything he has made. When the fullness of time came, he took upon himself human nature with all the essential properties and common weaknesses of it, but without sin. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Holy Spirit came down upon her and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. Thus, he was born of a woman from the tribe of Judah a descendant of Abraham and David in fulfillment of the scriptures. Two whole, perfect, and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in one person without converting one into the other or mixing them together to produce a different or blended nature. This person is truly God and truly man, yet one Christ the only mediator between God and humanity. That's a mouthful, but it's wonderful. And it's a great way to understand why the Bible would call Jesus Christ wonderful. Truly, there's, like we just sung, there's no one else who can compare. Anyone else who's ever been born uh, in this world, no one else can be described in those terms, only the wonderful Savior of God's elect, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate this time of year. Truly, his name is wonderful. Then Isaiah goes on to use another name, Counselor. Counselor. And that simply means one who gives counsel, someone with much wisdom and knowledge. 
And uh, we see this fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. For example, if you flip over a couple of pages to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. This is a passage along with many others in the book of Isaiah that the New Testament presents to us as being fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, we read these words. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. But in addition to this, in addition to this, uh, when we actually read about the ministry of, of Jesus, when he walked upon the earth, he displayed much wisdom and knowledge. Even as a little boy being raised by Mary and Joseph, he confounded the Jewish religious leaders and teachers of his day. And during his earthly ministry, the people recognized that he taught as one having great authority. But beyond that, beyond his display of his possession of great wisdom and knowledge, beyond all of that, the New Testament tells us that Jesus in his person is wisdom and knowledge itself. For example, in Colossians 2 and verse 3, we're told about Jesus that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's an amazing statement. Lots of people in this world spend their lives studying, pursuing wisdom and knowledge. And the Bible says that there is this treasure chest, this treasure trove of incomprehensible, uh, invaluable wisdom and knowledge, and it's in Jesus Christ himself. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, the Bible tells us that of him, that is of God, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God. Wisdom personified. Wisdom and knowledge. And that comes out in one of the New Testament's names for Jesus, another name for Jesus. That's the word logos. And it's the, re the root word for logic. And so if you, if you think about how the Bible presents Jesus as the Logos from God, um, the one through whom and for whom all things were made and by whom all things hold together and consist. There is this logic that is discoverable in the physical universe and the Bible says that that logic finds its culmination and origin in Jesus Christ. Because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge personally. That's who Jesus is. What a great privilege to have such a great counselor available to us. Wonderful counselor. Then Isaiah adds, Mighty God. Mighty God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And I read for you earlier from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, where we're told uh, of another of his names, Emmanuel, uh, that means God with us. And it's, it's easy to say that when God blesses his people, God in his blessing is with us. But when the Bible says that 
Jesus' name is God with us, it means something way much more than that, way more literal than that. It means that in the person of Jesus Christ, God is with us. And that's because this name, Mighty God, is one of the Old Testament names for God. It's the, it's the word El Gibor, which means literally Mighty God. So catch the power and significance of that. There's a lot of people, uh, unbelieving Jews for one, um, people from different sects and religious groups who have some sort of respect for the Bible, but they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Well, here is an Old Testament text who talks about a son born of a virgin. His name shall be call, called God with us. And he's going to be born. He's going to be given. And all of these great things are true about, of, about him, including the fact that his name is El Gabor. His name is Mighty God. So this Messiah, this Savior promised in the Old Testament is none other than the God of the Old Testament, God himself, the creator and maker of heaven and earth. And of course, the New Testament makes this really plain. The Apostle John begins his gospel by referring to this. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John connects the, the deity of Christ with Christmas in verse 14 of John chapter 1, when he said, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then uh, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, wrote, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And that is a mystery. We don't apologize for that. We don't try to explain it away. How is it that the eternal God who always existed, the eternal God who spoke all things into existence at the beginning, the one who knows no limits, in a given place and at a certain time became a man. And he didn't bypass humanity in doing so. He wasn't superman. But he was a true human being with a true human body and a true human soul. How can that be? I don't know. All I know is that with God, nothing will be impossible. This is what God promised that he would do in the Old Testament scriptures. And this is what the New Testament says has been done. And guess what? It's had such an impact on the world that uh, Western civilization's calendar and sense of time and history is calibrated with respect to it. This is exactly what has happened. God has been manifested in the flesh in the birth of Jesus Christ. God came into this world. He was conceived in the virgin's womb, went through the process of birth, lived as an infant and a young boy and a man, and he ultimately died on Calvary's cross. But make no mistake about it, Christians worship and obey Jesus Christ as God. He's not something other than God. He's not a little God. He's not God with a little g. Jesus Christ is God. He was not just a religious leader. He was not just a good teacher. 
He was not just a miracle worker. He was not just a prophet. He was not even just an angel. He is, in the language of the Nicene Creed, which we sung in that great hymn, uh, O Come All Ye Faithful, Jesus is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. That is Jesus Christ. That is the person whose birth or incarnation we celebrate this time of year. That's the child who was born, the son who was given, to use Isaiah's language, mighty God. And by the way, that's really important for our salvation. Not just so that we would be orthodox, confessing faith in the God of the Bible, but do you realize that for our salvation, we actually needed mighty God to be our Savior? That's how bad our sin problem is. Our sin has so alienated us from the holy and righteous God who made us that the only thing that can reconcile us to God is the death of God as it were himself. The Bible says that that's exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says that God has purchased the church for himself by God's own blood. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it was the God-man laying down his life. No other sacrifice would do. No other death would pay the price for our sins. Even our own death won't pay the price for our sins except for an eternal death which goes on forever and ever and ever in hell. It's a terrible thought. But that's why we needed the mighty God, Jesus, to die in our place. And then also the mighty God, Jesus, gives us the very righteousness of God that we don't deserve and that we didn't earn. So praise God. God, that God has provided exactly who we need to save us, the Son of God, none other than the mighty God. Then Isaiah goes on to refer to Jesus as everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Everlasting is just another way of saying that this son, this child, even though he was born at a particular point in time, yet he existed since eternity. It's the same idea, in fact, it's the same word that uh, the prophet Micah used in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 when describing Israel's future ruler who would be born in Bethlehem and Micah wrote, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. It's the same kind of language that the Bible uses to describe God, like in uh, Psalm uh, 90, where it says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The New Testament picks up this theme regarding Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says about Jesus, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's another way of describing the fact that Jesus Christ is eternal. He is everlasting. But notice that Isaiah calls this son everlasting father. That's an interesting way to describe a son, father. And that's not to mix up father and son. 
even though Father and Son, in terms of the Godhead, are one and the same God, there is a distinction in roles between Father and Son. But what Isaiah is probably referring to here is the fact that this Son who would be given would be a benevolent protector. Remember in verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This ruler, this one uh, upon whose shoulders would rest the government of God's creation is not someone who does not care about those whom he rules. But he has the heart of a father. He's a king, he's a ruler, he's a sovereign, but he's a father-like king. And Isaiah uses the language elsewhere in his prophecy in chapter 22. This is why I think it's, this is probably what he means in chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 through 21. About this future king, Eliakim. In that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. And then listen to this. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. By the way, a side note. Um, the language that follows in verse 22, he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Jesus applies that language to himself in Revelation chapter 3, but side note. But here's what I want you to note for now. This future king, Eliakim, will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Not a literal father. But he's going to be such a benevolent king, such a caring, concerned, and loving king that he will be like a father to Jerusalem and to Israel. And you know what, brothers and sisters? That is the kind of ruler that God has given us in Jesus. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of Lords. But he is also like a father to us in the sense that he loves his people and he cares for us and he is concerned about us. And I think that the passage in the New Testament that just makes that so plain more than any other is in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. It doesn't use the word father to describe Jesus, but it certainly shows Jesus to be utterly concerned and committed to the well-being of his people. So notice in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of of others. And by the way, that's a really good summary of what's wrong with us by nature. It's a great way of summarizing our state in sin. What do we as sinful people do? We naturally look to our own interests. We're naturally selfish. And Jesus, it turns out, is the exact opposite of that. He looks to the interests of others. So verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he is the eternal God. And we've seen several biblical witnesses to that. 
He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he didn't cling to his rights as the eternal sovereign Lord and basically refuse to be born and to come into this world as the form of a servant. He didn't play his, his God card, but he instead gave up the full exercise and privileges of his right as God in order to come into this world. Verse 7, But made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So this is the extent to which Jesus Christ went because he is so concerned for the welfare of his people because he loves his sheep so much. He came from the glory of heaven to be born on the earth as a poor man. And then he suffered and then he ultimately died on the cross to take away our sins to pay the penalty, to redeem us with a price that we could never pay in order that we would be saved. And then notice what comes next. Therefore, Paul says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no king, no Lord, no ruler who can be compared to that. Amen. And yet, notice what Jesus does for his people. And frankly, that's why we're so happy not just to celebrate Christ's birth once a year, but to remember Jesus Sunday by Sunday and frankly, to live for Jesus, to lay down our lives for Jesus, to obey him, to follow him, to keep his commandments as King of kings and Lord of lords. Not just because of, what, of who Jesus is, because of what he has done. He has given up so much. He has done so much to save his people from their sins that it's our reasonable sacrifice to give in return our lives. to not any longer live for ourselves, but to live for him who loved us and gave himself for us. Everlasting Father. Fifthly and finally, Isaiah uses this name or title for Jesus, Prince of Peace. So back in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince is a title of royalty, of sovereignty. He's Prince of Peace. And Isaiah wrote in chapter 11 about this ultimate expression of peace that this Prince of Peace, the Messiah, has come to accomplish. So in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4, we read this. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. And um, he's going to go on and talk about uh, these expressions of peace 
on the new earth that even find their way into nature itself so that wolves will no longer be harmful and snakes will no longer be harmful because peace from the the prince of peace will reign. That's the ultimate expression of the peace that the prince of peace is responsible for. That's the culmination of it. But there's even more to it than that. So we're told, for example, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself taught, blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs sh- uh, they shall receive, receive the kingdom of God. And we, saw, we already saw uh, a hint in Isaiah chapter 11 about how the meek shall inherit the earth. And so the followers of Jesus, those who believe in him, those in whom Jesus dwells by faith, will be and are peacemakers. We're not out to make war. We're not out to divide people. We're not looking for an argument. We're not uh, itching for a fight. We're peacemakers. But do you know the most profound and personal way in which Jesus is the Prince of Peace is, again, what he does for us in the gospel. So now look in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul wrote this about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and that word justified means that uh, God, who's the judge of the living and the dead, angels and human beings, God the judge has declared us righteous by faith. Not because of anything that we have done, but by virtue of faith that we have in Jesus, we have been justified by faith. And then listen to this. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of the death that Jesus Christ died in our behalf. But this implies that before this justification by faith, we didn't have peace with God. And that's the hard truth that many people in our culture don't want to hear. And Paul goes on to elaborate on that in the verses that follow. In verse 6, we are called ungodly. And in verse 7, we're called sinners. And in verse 9, in fact, let's read verses 8 through 11. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we had fixed ourselves or not when we had taken the first steps or not when God saw that there was some light in us that was worthy of our redemption. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, required his death, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. You know, Christians talk about salvation and being saved and, hey, we want you to be saved and that's true. But what are we saved from? Ultimately, the Bible says we are saved from the wrath of God. That's a hard truth. That means that God has holy and righteous anger against sin and against sinners. And again, it took nothing less than the substitutionary death of Almighty God Himself, Jesus, to save us from that. Then he says, we are reconciled and we shall be saved by his life. More than that, verse 11, 
we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So that's a great way of encapsulating the peace that the Prince of Peace brings us. He brings us reconciliation with God. He brings us salvation from the wrath of God. And while Christians as peacemakers should be interested in world peace, in peaceful human relations, there's no peace that can compare to peace with God, our maker and our judge. There's no peace that can compare with being reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate. That's the greatest gift imaginable. There's no gift card. There's no present. There's, there's no Christmas gift that can be neatly wrapped and put under the tree that can possibly measure up to being reconciled to God in a relationship of peace. No controversy between you and God. No condemnation. Because Jesus has come into the world and lived and died and rose again so that sinners like us might have peace. So how should we respond to these things? The famous hymn tells us, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Born the king of angels. O come, let us adore him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful Savior that you've provided. We thank you for the reality and message of Christmas. And I pray, Lord, that you would be at work in hearts in this place today. You know us. We pray, Lord, for those who need to be encouraged and strengthened and comforted. Would you do that for them this morning? For those, Lord, who need to be awakened from their, their stupor, maybe their backsliding, Lord, from uh, saying that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but living as if they don't. Lord, bring them to repentance today. Or perhaps, Lord, those who do not know you, who are not following Jesus, who are not believers, may today be the day of their salvation, Lord. Draw them to Jesus Christ and save them. And Lord, may we be a congregation not just singing Christmas hymns, but a congregation of redeemed sinners singing of our great salvation and our great Savior. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.